Welcome to Art Break, the lecture series dedicated to seeing art through a different lens. Each session features a speaker who gives insight into their worldview by sharing their interpretation of works of art at the CMA. The current exhibition in discussion is Visions from India, a breathtaking exhibition of 21st century painting, sculpture, and multimedia works from India and its diaspora. Today, we welcome Dr. Denyar Patel, a former assistant professor of history at the University of South Carolina, now teaching in and joining us from Mumbai, India. Please welcome Dr. Denyar Patel. All right. Um, thank you, first of all, for having me for this, this art talk. It's, it's a pleasure to, to speak to the Columbia Museum of Art. Uh, in spite of being at quite a distance, I'm, I'm talking to you uh, from Mumbai uh, in India. Um, and today, what I'm going to talk about, uh, to give you a little bit of background on, on the exhibit that uh, uh, the Columbia Museum of Art is hosting, uh, is the history of art and architecture um, in modern India. Now, I'll preface this by, by mentioning one important caveat. Uh, India is a lot like Europe in the sense that there are so many different cultures and traditions and languages, uh, so that you know, if, if you want to give a talk on Indian art, uh, you invariably will only be able to talk about a small portion of that particular tradition. There's only so much that you can say within about uh, you know 45 minutes or so. Uh, so again, it's, it's like talking about European art from only the perspective of say Italy or Germany or uh, Great Britain. There, there's, there are lots of things that you you cannot uh, cover uh, because you only have a finite period of time. Uh, but let me try to at least hit some of the the major themes of, of Indian art. Um, and one of the biggest themes uh, that pervades not just Indian art but but history in general. Uh, is this idea called syncretism. Um, and syncretism is basically a fancy word uh, that describes the process of blending and mixing of traditions. Um, and it's, it's, it's really an important highlight in Indian tradition. Um, in India, so many different cultures and traditions have mixed over the past several thousand years uh, that inevitably what you have is, is you know, a mix of different uh, ideas, even in traditions that are thought of as being relatively authentic. So, you know, within Hinduism, uh, the in influences from around the world, within Islam in India, the traditions from around the world, uh, so forth and so on. Um, India is a bit of a contradiction in, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very conservative and, and, and very orthodox society in, on many levels. Uh, but at the same same time, it's been extremely receptive and extremely outward looking uh, and embracing of, of uh, outside influences. Uh, pretty much every major religious tradition in the world and several minor religious traditions uh, have flourished in India from, uh, you know, relatively big traditions like is Islam and Christianity uh, to smaller traditions like Baha'ism and, and Zoroastrianism, uh, leave alone what is, you know, called the Indic, Indi Indi uh, Indic tr religious traditions like Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism and such. Um, so syncretism goes back a long time. I mean, this 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 blending and mixing of of influences goes back uh, a very long time. And indeed, if we look at art from you know over two thousand years ago, uh, we see that right after the invasions of Alexander the Great, you you have a very strong Hellenic influence on art that's produced uh, in India. Uh, you have um, Buddhist sculptures produced in an area called Gandhara, which is today in, in Pakistan. Uh, which have you know a very distinct kind of Hellenic look to it, um, so that has been the norm uh, in in Indian history. And in the in the past thousand years, uh, the two outside influences that have been the most predominant uh, have been Islam and most recently uh, traditions from the West, you know, British traditions, uh, Western European traditions. Um, and these two influences have resulted in a in a dizzying variety of uh, of different ideas and traditions in, in art. Um, now. This process of mixing and blending has occasionally been violent. Uh, you know, there have been incidences where you know the mixing of different religious traditions have, have, have caused conflict. Uh, but overall, the process is, has been remarkably peaceful and uh, you know uh, remarkably creative as well. Uh, so you know, as you can see from the screen, uh, what 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 I have over here is, is a picture of a, of a Muslim mosque, um, and the pillars that are being used in this mosque. Uh, are not traditionally Muslim in terms of art. In fact, uh, uh, they come from the, the Jain tradition in, 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 in India. Uh, and one reason why they've been incorporated in a lot of mosques in India is because Muslims would actually employ Jain artisans who are known for their uh, you know, building tradition in order to build their mosques. Uh, so, you know, automatically, you know, when you're in, you know, the most typical Muslim of, of settings in, in India, the architecture around you could be anything but Muslim. It could be regarded as being almost heretical in, in other aspects of uh, the Islamic tradition in other parts of the world. Yet in India, it's it's worked. Now, 
the Indo-Islamic tradition reached a high point uh, beginning in the 1500s under the Mughal Empire. Uh, the Mughal Empire started in the year 1526. Uh, it started with a group of Central Asians who, who came from uh, what is today in Uzbekistan, uh, invaded India through Afghanistan, and technically it lasted all the way up until 1857. Although for the for the last uh, 100 or so, or so years, the Mughal empires were largely uh, ruling as, uh, as puppets of, of, of the British. Uh, now, the Mughals brought, um, you know, various elements to the table. You know, they brought Islamic traditions from Persia, uh, from Central Asia, but they also in their art blended uh, indigenous Indian influences, uh, as well as influences from as far away as places like China. So you can see that uh, quite predominantly in their art. Uh, and they built up a great um, you know, commercial and political empire uh, that really rivaled in power and size only the Qing Empire in China. Uh, and you know another great uh, you know empire that was coterminous with with the Mughals was the Ottoman. So it was one of the world's great um, empires uh, in the pre-modern era. Um, and although the Mughals were Muslim, uh, and although several of them were quite devout Muslims, uh, they nevertheless uh, patronized. Uh, individuals who are not Muslim. So they, they patronized Hindu holy figures, uh, they patronized uh, Hindu musicians and writers, and uh, they even sponsored the, uh, the translation of a large body of Sanskrit work uh, in the Hindu tradition into uh, into Persian. So they were relatively open-minded. And, and again, you know, they were Muslim, but at the same time, um, they, you know, practiced certain elements that would not tr traditionally be regarded as being, you know, uh, Islamic. They were very fond of drink. They were very fond of, of music. Uh, so they, they, they were relatively open-minded. Um, and so, you know, under the Mughals, there was a great flowering of, of art throughout India. Um, and so you have, again, this, this mixing of, of kind of Hindu, Indian traditions with Muslim traditions, and, and inevitably and eventually, uh, you get another added influence, that, that other main ingredient in, into Indian syncretism, um, specifically uh, the West. So here you have a painting from um, uh, a, a text called the Akbar Nama. Uh, the Akbar Nama was one of these uh, works that chronicled uh, the, the doings and deeds of uh, one, the greatest uh, Mughal Empire, uh, Emperor Akbar, uh, who ruled uh, from 1556 onward for about 50 or so years. Uh, and Akbar was an interesting figure in the sense that, you know, first of all, he expanded the Mughal Empire to, uh, you know, a very great extent. He made it very rich. Uh, he made it both a land-based empire and a sea-based empire. Uh, he started off being a relatively orthodox Muslim ruler. I mean, he was someone who even embarked on jihads. Uh, against uh, individuals who are not uh, Muslim, uh, but he eventually became, uh, you know, kind of the epitome of the tolerant, open-minded Indian leader. Uh, with time, uh, he embraced syncretism in religion and tradition, in addition to art, uh, and he even, uh, you know, established a new capital where uh, there was something called the Ibadat Khana, which was a, a group of uh, people from various religious traditions who would gather together uh, and discuss religion. So in this uh, group, you'd have people who are Muslim clerics, uh, Hindu religious figures, Jains, uh, you would have Zoroastrian priests, uh, and also eventually you would have uh, Catholics. So in, in this painting, the, the two figures that you see at the, at the leftmost uh, part of the painting who are in black are actually Portuguese missionaries who came from Goa. Uh, one individual was a man called Rodolfo Aquaviva, who was a Jesuit missionary, um, and Jesuits took part in these religious discussions. They were uh, welcomed in, into uh, Akbar's court, uh, and Akbar even established a new religion. It unfortunately wasn't very successful, really. The only members of this religion was really him, Akbar, uh, himself. Um, but it was called the Dini Ilahi, and the principles of this religion were against were again molded on this idea of syncretism and blending of different ideas. So there were Islamic traditions that were brought in, uh, there were Christian elements, Zoroastrian elements, Hindu elements, uh, and it was meant to kind of, you know, be kind of a, a state system that uh, reflected India's uh, religious traditions. Uh, it angered a lot of orthodox people, uh, but at the same time, it was a way for a Muslim ruler uh, to, to, to kind of bind together an empire, which of course was not majority Muslim. Muslims were only a, a small minority in, in India. Um, at this time. And, and again, it's, it's through, you know, Akbar's time that we see again some of the first influences of, of Western art and architecture uh, pervading itself uh, in the Indian tradition. So here's a painting that comes from uh, another text on Akbar's life, something called the Aini Akbari. Uh, and this painting was done in 1630 after Akbar's uh, passing. 
uh, during the, the reign of, of, of his uh, successors. Um, and in this painting, you have a, a, you know, an idealized portrait of Akbar, uh, and there are very clear European influences that are coming uh, uh, into this uh, painting. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, Akbar himself is pictured with a halo, uh, and, and that's not necessarily a, a Western influence. Uh, Muslim uh, Mughal rulers cultivated kind of a semi-divine status, which in many ways was not similar to uh, not dissimilar to what European rulers were doing at the time, arguing that they were somehow chosen by God or even to a certain degree descended uh, from, uh, you know, kind of a um, you know, a, a godlike tradition. Uh, but you see at, at the very top of this painting, um, Western, uh, you know, Western style angels uh, playing on, on various instruments. And at the very bottom of the painting, you see another, uh, you know, import from uh, the, the European tradition, a lamb and uh, uh, a calf sitting side by side, representing, you know, kind of peaceful coexistence. Uh, so here you have, again, some of the, the first real direct influences uh, of European art, uh, the portrayal of a, a Muslim ruler, which actually is being uh, painted by, you know, a Hindu artist, Bovardhan. Um, and um, it's not surprising that you start to have Western influence at this time. Uh, the East India Company, uh, the English East India Company had been established in the year 1600. And a few years after that, it had gone out to India for the first time to, uh, to meet uh, Akbar's son, Jahangir. Uh, and established trading relations uh, with India. Uh, and from that on time onward, um, the English, uh, you know, transported elements of their art and culture as well as uh, participated in uh, in commerce and, you know, military dealings uh, with, uh, with the Indians. Um, so again, this was kind of a bridgehead for wider European influence uh, uh, throughout uh, the Mughal Empire. Now, as we know, this, this European influence did not eventually become peaceable. Uh, it became uh, quite overtly military in its, its focus. Um, the East India Company began as a commercial enterprise, uh, but by the year 1757, uh, the East India Company had actually become uh, a military and political power as well. It, it controlled large chunks of India, which at one point in time had been ruled directly by the Mughals. Uh, and consequently, we see art being deployed against um, Europeans uh, as well. So um, while the East India Company was growing uh, throughout India, uh, they encountered a lot of resistance uh, from various Indians. And uh, the, the greatest threat towards British control uh, towards uh, the end of the 1700s from, from Indians themselves uh, was from a man called Tipu Sultan, who was the ruler of the Mysore Kingdom in the south of India, what is today around Bangalore and uh, you know, the, the city of Mysore in southern India. Um, and Tipu Sultan styled himself as, uh, you know, kind of a modern ruler. Uh, he wanted to borrow elements from the West that he saw as being useful, uh, but he did not want the British to dominate uh, his part of India. Uh, to, so to that degree, he actually allied with the French. Uh, he uh, partnered with the French uh, in order to incorporate uh, Western military techniques to, to, to get Western um, arms and uh, Western military training. Um, and he used art to kind of portray how he would eventually be successful against the British. Now, Tipu's uh, symbol was the tiger. Uh, and perhaps the most famous uh, work of art that uh, was created during his realm is what you see in this picture, uh, which was actually a musical organ um, that portrayed a tiger symbolizing Tipu Sultan uh, mauling a British redcoat. Uh, and if you cranked up the organ, the organ would uh, would emit the cries of, of, of an Englishman who was being mauled to death. Uh, so here was a symbol again of how art could be used against your enemies. Now, unfortunately, it didn't go very well for Tipu. Uh, Tipu Sultan was eventually defeated in the year 1799 uh, by, the, by the British. Uh, none other than Arthur Wellesley, the, later the Duke of Wellington, the man who defeated uh, Napoleon at Waterloo, uh, defeated Tipu Sultan. Um, and after this defeat, you once again see art being used in order to portray this uh, military campaign. Uh, so as I told you, Tipu was being um, symbolized by a tiger. Well, the, the British uh, thought of their symbol as being the lion. Uh, so right after Tipu Sultan was uh, defeated and killed in battle, uh, the British issued medals uh, to all of those uh, soldiers who participated in this battle, uh, which featured a lion mauling to death a tiger. So again, you know, the British defeating uh, Tipu Sultan. So, so art had various ways of being represented uh, in this kind of violent process of increasing um, uh, English, uh, British, and, and Western influence throughout India that translated from, you know, from uh, the perspective of art into political and military control. Now, 
coterminous to what's going on in terms of uh, you know military conflict in in the south uh, vis-a-vis the British and Tipu Sultan, uh, you start to see a large influx of artists come in from Europe uh, who uh, portray India in their in their artwork. And uh, two of the most um, famous um, uh, artists who come from uh, who come in this era from Great Britain were the Daniel brothers, Thomas and Williams uh, uh, Daniel. Um, now they come uh, in the, uh, the the 1780s and the 1790s, and they spend seven years touring around India, uh, painting watercolors of various Indian scenes. Um, and their paintings today represent kind of a you know kind of the way that in, uh, that India was portrayed in a, in a positive light by by Indian artists. Uh, you know the the paintings they, they they painted were of quite idyllic scenes, like what you see over here. A scene from the uh, the city of Banaras or Varanasi, uh, the whole, the, arguably the holiest uh, city for the, the Hindus, and, and particularly the, the ghats along the river Ganges or the Ganga. Uh, so the the Daniels portrayed a very idealized image of, of Indian life, and they portrayed both uh, you know Indian life and, and British life in India. You know, some of the most famous paintings are scenes of the city of Calcutta uh, that emerges as as the center of, of British power uh, in India. Uh, but a lot of artists who came to India at this time. Uh, portrayed India in in a less positive light. I mean, a, a lot of the artistic reaction to Indian art was uh, less positive. There was a, a certain degree of criticism and denigration. The idea that the Indian art was somehow, uh, you know, excessive. It was exotic, um, and certainly Protestant traditions that kind of looked against, ide- uh, you know, idol worship, um, especially in, in the Hindu tradition, uh, were at work here. So, you know, there, there was, you know, the, the standard European narrative, the critical narrative at least, uh, was that the Indian artistic tradition was kind of degraded. Maybe at one point in time it had been great, like, you know, that in, in, in Rome or Greece, but over time it had become decadent, degraded, and it kind of collapsed under its own, its own weight. Um, so they really start to emerge two different traditions from this point on, uh, onwards. So there was this tradition of great criticism that lasted throughout the 20th century. Uh, so, you know, in the 20th century, one of the most famous British architects, um, a man called Edwin Lutyens, who actually builds the city of New Delhi, uh, came to India and he, uh, you know, surveyed great Indian uh, um, archaeological and artistic sites. He was not very impressed. He went to the Taj Mahal and he said it was nice, but he said it was small beer. Uh, it was nothing in comparison to the works of, say, Christopher Wren. Now, at the other side of the spectrum, you do have a tradition of uh, what of people who are called Orientalists, who uh, actually really took to Indian art and architecture. Uh, they developed a profound interest and actually helped in, in, in many ways kind of peel back the layers of history and discover what Indian art and architecture had been uh, in hitherto uh, forgotten periods of time. So it's, it's in, in this era that you see a lot of uh, British scholars uh, rediscover things like, say, the you know the reign of Ashoka, when uh, India had this great flowering of, of Buddhism and and art reflect, reflected kind of a, a Buddhist tradition. Uh, so the the Orientalists kind of were very favorable to the Indian artistic tradition and and definitely pushed it forward and pushed for its revival. Uh, but they were in competition uh, with with many others who who did not see things in a very uh, charitable light. Now, turning to architecture. When the British started building uh, lots of uh, structures in India, they, they immediately faced a question. What style of architecture should they build? Uh, should they build in uh, British and, and European styles, or should they try to adopt uh, Indian styles or even blend the two? Should they develop some sort of syncretic artistic style that reflected both the West and, and India and the traditions? Um, and at least initially, uh, when the British built their own buildings in places like Calcutta or Bombay or Madras, uh, they began by actually importing uh, wholesale uh, their own artistic traditions. Uh, so neoclassical architecture, which was quite popular in, in Great Britain in the late 1700s and early 1800s, uh, becomes the dominant narrative uh, when the British uh, decide to build, uh, when the British decide to build in India as well. Uh, so the picture you see over here is of what's regarded as uh, the greatest neoclassical uh, building in India. Uh, it's uh, the town hall in, in Mumbai, which was built in the year 1833. Uh, the columns of this building, the Doric columns, were actually manufactured in Great Britain and shipped out to Bombay. Uh, so that's to you know to that extent uh, you have British tradition 
being actually imported into a, a foreign environment. Um, and you know, neoclassical architecture is is used throughout Calcutta uh, as a very deliberate um, you know emphasis of British power being dominant in India uh, and British culture and tradition being somehow dominant over uh, the you know Indian styles in, in, in Indian architecture. So it, it was very much a language of power that was incorporated also in, into architecture. But again, there were people who differed uh, from, from this tradition. Uh, you know, keeping in the tradition of the Orientalists, there were those Britons who uh, took to Indian art and architecture and in many cases kind of, you know, exceeded Indians in, in terms of, you know, playing with these, these artistic and architectural traditions. Um, and a great example, I mean, one of my most favorite examples of, of someone who, uh, you know, kind of took to the Indian art, artistic and, uh, and architectural traditions was a man called uh, Swinton Jacob. Uh, who was a, a British individual who was actually born in India. Uh, and he was uh, fascinated by art and architecture, specifically coming out of Rajasthan. Uh, so he was an engineer, he was an architect, uh, and he built a, a few buildings in Jaipur, uh, one of the most important cities in, in Rajasthan, uh, which from the surface you would never imagine uh, was designed by, by an Englishman. Uh, yet that building you see, the, the, the Albert Hall, which is a museum that still stands to this day in Jaipur, uh, was built by a British man. And, um, you know, several politically important Britons uh, supported this kind of, you know, adoption of Indian styles and even redeployment and redefining of Indian styles. So uh, Lord Curzon, who was uh, arguably the, the most powerful British viceroy in the early, uh, early 20th century, uh, thought that Jacob was, uh, you know, the, the, the best professional architect in India. He wanted Jacob to be used uh, in his various uh, building products uh, and, and uh, various building projects. Now, um, Jacob authored something called the Jaipur Portfolio, which was a, a catalog of various uh, Indian artistic traditions and ar architectural styles, which he wanted to be used as kind of a template. So any Indian architect could use these templates that would, you know, kind of spell out various traditions and styles of windows or balconies or roofs. Uh, and you could kind of put them together like a jigsaw puzzle and arrange a building that somehow resembled uh, you know, Indian uh, Indian art or Indian building styles. Uh, with no surprise, this tradition was contemporaneous with the uh, British arts and crafts movement uh, that that you see happening uh, in uh, in the United Kingdom. So, you know, the, there, there were spin-offs of, of the arts and crafts movement in, in India as well, um, and there were critics. Just as you know, the uh, you know the the arts uh, and crafts movement had its critics in Great Britain, there were those who criticized this tradition uh, in India as well. I mean, some critics uh, accused people like Jacob of out moguling the moguls, making things that were even more moguls than than the, the moguls ever fancied to be. Um, but it, it nevertheless is you know, quite an interesting chapter in, in uh, the, the history of British imperialism in India. Now, inevitably, these two styles, the you know, Indian styles, whatever you want to call them, uh, and uh, British styles or Western styles blended together into some new syncretic tradition. Um, and that particular syncretic tradition was what was called the Indo-Saracenic tradition. Um, and this was a style of architecture which again kind of uh, imitated the, uh, the, the power dynamics of colonialism. So European forms would be used. So if, if you look at the buildings in this picture here, uh, you see a train station and uh, the headquarters of uh, the municipal government of Bombay. So on, on the right is uh, Victoria Terminus, which to this day is uh, one of the biggest uh, railway terminuses in, in Mumbai. And to the left is the headquarters of the Bombay Municipal Corporation. Um, and by and large, these are European style buildings, uh, but the outside decoration uh, is to a large degree Indian in style. You know, the particular dome that's being used, the style of windows, the style of columns. Uh, so there is a melding of traditions, but again, that power dynamic uh, is very much in play uh, where the European form is dominant and the, the, the Indian style is being used almost as uh, window dressing. Uh, now, Indo-Saracenic was, you know, a, a multi-headed creature. I mean, there were there were some, uh, you know, examples of Indo-Saracenic where, you know, Indian architecture was much more incorporated and, and those where it was much less incorporated. Uh, and it really ran the gamut in terms of styles that were used. Uh, so in Bombay, uh, Gothic styles of architecture and particular Venetian Gothic, you know, ideas that were borrowed from uh, thinkers and critics like John Ruskin uh, played a very dominant role. So, you know, if you go around parts of uh, southern Mumbai today, a lot of the buildings that you see today have, you know, artistic lineages going back to, uh, you know, Gothic buildings in Venice, like the Doge's Palace, 
uh, because these were the styles that were kind of favored in Great Britain at the time, and they were uh, therefore um, you know, exported to India as, as well. It's a rather bizarre tradition. Um, again, you know, other types of uh, Indian and uh, Western traditions blended in different ways. So this is the Victoria Memorial, which was a, a memorial built to Queen Victoria, started by Lord Curzon, again, a, a very powerful uh, Indian, uh, British Indian Viceroy, ruler of, 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 of British India in the early 20th century. Uh, and he famously, uh, according to, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 you know, at least according to popular belief, wanted to build a building that would rival the Taj Mahal. Uh, and he definitely built a building in, in size and scale. It's, it's questionable of whether, you know, it was as artistically, um, you know, great a building as the Taj Mahal. But here again, you see a blending of European kind of Italian at forms uh, with Indian style domes, some Indian style architectural features and, uh, you know, other elements uh, incorporated uh, throughout the building. Um, so, you know, it, this, this was done in, in quite a grand scale. Uh, and perhaps the most grand example of how uh, Indian and Western art was blended uh, into architecture uh, was the city of New Delhi. Uh, now, New Delhi was a planned city uh, like Washington DC or Canberra uh, in Australia or, or many other colonial cities at the time. It, it was built as kind of an annex to uh, the city of Delhi, which has existed for, for, for hundreds of years. Uh, and it was built as, a, as a, you know, a new capital city in the very early 20th century. The work began in 1911 and it finished in 1931. Um, and this is perhaps the best example to show how the British themselves thought of themselves as being the new, the new moguls, the new, the new rulers in charge. Uh, so this painting that you see is done in the mogul miniature style. Okay? So you, you have an image of you know, a ruler being presented something by you know, two or three uh, individuals. The ruler is on a, a, a raised cushion seat, and in the very background, you have what looks like a queen. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that most of the individuals you see in this work of art are actually British people, are, are white people. Uh, so th the man on the throne uh, is the viceroy of, of India, a man called Lord Omen. Uh, and the individuals presenting him uh, items are the architects of the city of uh, uh, New Delhi. So uh, Hobart Baker and Edwin Lutyens were presenting him with models of the buildings that they have built uh, in New Delhi. So um, Edwin Lutyens is presenting him with a model of the Viceroy's house, which uh, which actually is uh, you know the largest palace palace by area uh, that was built uh, up into that era. It's actually bigger than Versailles in terms of the square feet, um, uh, square, uh, square footage. Uh, the woman who's in Parda or who's in the background there is is the, the wife of Lord of Lord Owen, uh, Lady uh, Lady Owen. And she's situ uh, situated kind of as many Mughal princesses uh, would be situated, kind of separate from the rest of the men. Uh, so again, here's a good example of how the British thought of themselves as being uh, kind of the new Mughals uh, and incorporated their own traditions in, or, in order to represent uh, their particular power and status. So I've, I've talked to you about how the British saw themselves uh, and how they tried to blend uh, both European traditions and Indian traditions. Now, what about the vast majority of people in India, uh, Indians themselves? How did they incorporate um, different artistic traditions and ideas and technologies coming in from the West? Uh, and again, the story here is quite complex and varied. Uh, certainly by the uh, mid 1800s, you start to see uh, a great influence of, of Western art in Indian architecture and art being produced by Indians themselves. Um, and as importantly, the ideas and the concepts that are coming in through Western culture and technology are permeating into Indian art. Uh, so here you see, uh, you know, a, a pen etching from uh, 1870 from Punjab, uh, where you see a train. Uh, is being portrayed. Uh, you know, the, the, the first railway was built in India in the early 1850s, uh, and by the 1870s, there were rail lines being developed uh, throughout the length and breadth of, breadth of India. And it was it was arguably the you know, the greatest technology that was uh, imported into India uh, in the 19th century. It, it revolutionized so many aspects of Indian society. All of a sudden, you could go from one part of the country in days rather than months or weeks, and travel was relatively safe and reliable. Uh, and you know, the British thought that Indians would not take to train travel. They thought they were too traditional, too sedentary, and boy, were they wrong. Uh, Indians took to train travel uh, like anything. Uh, it was a very popular means of, 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 of getting around. Um, and soon enough, you start to see it being portrayed uh, in art. 
Now, in, in this particular uh, image, you, you see uh, six uh, members of, of the, the, the religious community from Punjab uh, being seated in rail carriages. And you see some of the rail carriages are actually divided by ethnicity and gender. So there, there are rail carriages which have only women. Uh, there are those that have only six. And there are one or two where there's only a British officer uh, who is, uh, you know, seated over there. So, you know, kind of this idea of segregation is, is embodied uh, in, in this uh, particular artwork. Now, slowly but surely, Western art forms become more predominant in uh, the art that Indian, Indians are producing. Uh, and perhaps the most famous Indian artist to incorporate uh, Western art traditions was a man called Raja Ravi Varma who comes from Kerala in the south of India. Uh, he came from a, a royal family, uh, but he sets himself up in Bombay at the end of the uh, 19th and, early, and beginning of the, uh, of the, of the 20th century. Uh, and he produces kind of a popular style of art that's, that's uh, very similar to kind of, you know, the commercial art that's been produced in, in Victorian England. Uh, and the art that he produces uh, is, um, you know, Western style images of traditional Indian scenes from uh, Indian mythology. Uh, so things like the Mahabharat, the, the Ramayan, uh, various other Indian epics. Uh, and these uh, paintings were lithographed and printed and mass produced. Uh, they were produced in uh, you know, calendars, in commercial art, uh, art that was distributed towards books. Uh, so here you see for the first time, Indian themes being expressed in a, in a Western idiom and being distributed to, you know, all across the country. I mean, you know, everyone from the poorest to the poor could have access to this through a lithographed uh, calendar or uh, work of art uh, that they could hang in their house. Uh, and you still see this tradition being represented in, in, in Indian households uh, to this day. So uh, here's another famous painting um, uh, that uh, Raja Ravi Varma uh, painted. This is actually the, the first painting that he ever painted uh, from a scene from the Ramayana, uh, the great Indian epic uh, featuring uh, the Hindu god Ram and his wife Sita. Uh, and in this particular image, uh, Sita is being actually carried into the bowels of the earth by uh, Mother Earth uh, and separated from, uh, from Ram. Um, and uh, this painting uh, was so popular in India that it actually earned uh, uh, Ravi Varma commission. Uh, one of the uh, Indian princes, uh, uh, the, uh, the Gaikwad of Baroda, the ruler of Baroda state in Gujarat, uh, actually uh, summoned him to his court and gave him, him commission and uh, patronized his art. And you know, it was really from this point onward that Ravi Varma's uh, career uh, took off. Uh, so this type of art, you know, excited both um, the common man uh, as well as uh, princes and, and elites uh, throughout India. And again, you know, this type of art is, is you know, you, you go into an Indian household today, you'll still see this, uh, this style of kind of devotional art, you know, very modern idiom uh, being displayed in, in any house. Now, I'm going to move uh, into the 20th century, which is, you know, in many ways, the, the most interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the blending of different ideas and concepts. Uh, and uh, I'll focus at least at the beginning uh, in Bengal, in Eastern India, because this is where a lot of the most interesting experiments were, were happening in, in art. Uh, Bengal was uh, you know, probably the most populous uh, part of, of, of India. It used to be the, uh, the richest, and it was a very dynamic center of you know, lots of immigration, lots of industrial and commercial output. And um, by the early 20th century, this had translated in, in a huge way uh, into art and literature and, and artistic production. Uh, and there emerged something called the Bengal School, a, a distinct school of art, which again was nurtured by certain Western forms. So uh, a British artist by the name of E.B. Havel, uh, who worked in British art schools in India, uh, kind of nurtured a group of artists who, again, incorporated Western forms, uh, but portrayed Indian themes. Um, and somewhat ironically, this, this man, Havel, uh, gave birth to a tradition which eventually got incorporated in Indian nationalism, which was used against uh, British colonialism. Uh, now, in this era, one of the defining features of, of Indian art, especially in the Bengal school, was this idea of Pan-Asianism. Um, in the early 20th century, there was a lot of disquiet and, and disillusion with Western modernism uh, in India. And this fed into the anti-colonial uh, frame uh, that was being developed and anti-colonial nationalism. Uh, and so Indians who were kind of rebelling against the West 
looked elsewhere in Asia for inspiration. They looked elsewhere in Asia for models uh, that could, you know, supplant Western modernity or Western nationalism. Uh, and therefore, they looked to places like China or Japan uh, or even Iran. Uh, and Japan, in particular, was a very important influence on uh, the Indian artistic tradition. Uh, because in this era, Japan was the one uh, Eastern nation that had shown that, you know, it really could kind of uh, match itself in, in terms of its economic and military uh, strength against the greatest of the great in, in Europe. Uh, the year 1905 is very significant in Indian history because that's the year when, uh, during the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese defeat the Russians. And, you know, for the first time in, in modern memory, you have an example of a, an Asian people defeating a great European uh, military power. And this stems a whole uh, a bunch of interest in, in India amongst you know Japanese culture and tradition. And you start to see uh, Indians going to Japan in order to uh, receive education or, or gain uh, you know artistic training. And in turn, you start to see a lot of Japanese coming to uh, places like Calcutta. Uh, so in particular, there was uh, a man called uh, Okakura Tenshin who comes to uh, Calcutta and he talks to uh, many important uh, Indian uh, artists or writers, people like Rabindranath Tagore. And there's this exchange of kind of pan-Asian values uh, so you start to see paintings produced uh, using kind of um, Asian or Japanese techniques like, uh, you know, the, the wash technique, uh, uh, use of uh, wood blocks in, in painting. Um, so a very strong kind of Japanese or East Asian flair. And this translates into uh, Indian nationalism. Uh, now, out of the Bengal school, you, you start to see representation of, of India itself, the country of India, uh, as like uh, as a mother-like figure. You start to see uh, paintings of this figure called Bharat Mata or, or Mother India. Uh, and again, you know, Mother India here is being portrayed in, in a bit of kind of like an Asian style, uh, you know, kind of again using wash techniques. Um, this is a painting by a man called Abhinindranath Tagore. There was another famous painter called Nandalal Bose, uh, who painted the previous painting I showed you. Uh, and these people, you know, played with concepts of Pan-Asianism. Um, and you increasingly start to see India being portrayed as this kind of motherly figure. Uh, this painting was painted in the year 1905, which again is significant, not just because of the, the Russo-Japanese War, which I mentioned, but it was also the first year of something called the Swadeshi Movement. Uh, which was the first real uh, mass anti-colonial Indian nationalist movement against British rule. Uh, this was the first moment when vast portions of Indian society rose up and protested uh, British colonial rule and deployed things like strikes or, or even violence against colonial rule. Uh, and you start to see this art playing a very important role in kind of moving this movement along. Um, and slowly but surely, you see India being portrayed more and more as kind of a motherly figure. Uh, and increasingly, the figure of India as a woman is being literally mapped onto uh, an, a, a cartographic image of, of, of India. So, you know, in the tradition of Raja Ravi Varma, here is a, a painting that again would have been uh, commercially reproduced and lithographed uh, and distributed around the country. Something that was very cheap and would have been uh, reproduced with say calendars or, or religious books. Uh, and you see a painting of Mother India uh, conforming exactly to the contours of, of India on a map. Uh, and this is no mistake. Again, you know, India is being portrayed as, as a goddess. Uh, and, you know, this goes to quite incredible lengths. Um, in the city of Banaras in the 1920s, uh, an Indian nationalist leader actually commissions a temple, a Hindu temple, where the principal icon in this temple is, 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 is not a goddess or a god, but actually a relief map of India. So here you have India being portrayed as a god, you know, to its, its most uh, you know, extreme form. And none other than Mahatma Gandhi goes and inaugurates uh, this particular temple uh, in the year 1936. Uh, so again, India being personified uh, in many ways. And, you know, this temple uh, is, you know, still exists in India and uh, every Independence Day, apparently, uh, what is being portrayed as uh, you know, the ocean is, is filled with water and flowers are, are bedecked on the landmass of, of India. Uh, so it, it's something that's still very much in the religious tradition in, in Banaras. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, of course, was the most famous Indian nationalist leader to emerge uh, from you know, the, the 1910s onward as, as a great uh, Indian anti-colonial leader. And again, inevitably, Gandhi gets incorporated into art. 
uh, Gandhi himself left his own artistic legacy. Uh, you know, Gandhi was emphasizing a lot of things in terms of, uh, you know, the clothing he wore or uh, the buildings he, he lived in or the type of lifestyle that he emphasized. Uh, so he emphasized simplicity, uh, kind of a return to homespun, uh, you know, cloths or uh, cottage industries, home produced goods. Um, and what you start to see is kind of, you know, the production of, uh, you know, again, cheap cloth, things called like khadi cloth, cloth which is produced at home. Uh, this is incorporated into art, which is again supposed to kind of symbolize um, the simplicity of, of rural life and also identification with the poorest of the poor. Uh, the poorest Indians could only afford rough khadi cloth. That was, you know, they only had enough money to, to buy the poorest cloth. So you start to see this kind of uh, symbol of simplicity and poverty being incorporated into art. Uh, and increasingly, Gandhi himself is being incorporated into art as well. So Nandalal Bose, this figure who we've talked about before in Pan-Asian art coming out of uh, uh, Bengal, uh, starts to portray Gandhi in art. And you, you see him again being portrayed in kind of simplistic, you know, you know, dual, dual toned uh, forms. Uh, this is a portrayal of Gandhi during something called the Salt March, where Gandhi walks about 200 miles from the city of Ahmedabad to the sea in order to uh, collect salt and symbolically break a law that actually was existence in the British time that prevented you from making your own, your own salt. Uh, you had to buy salt from a, a colonial uh, monopoly and pay an exorbitant price. And, and you know, this kind of really was a kind of a totemic moment in the nationalist movement, a, a very nonviolent moment. Um, and, and to this day, Gandhi still is an, is an important symbol in, in Indian art. Uh, one of the, the artists in your exhibit, Jagannath Panda, uh, has a painting called The Icon, which is uh, an image of Gandhi's statue. Uh, and and to, to this day, if you go to any major Indian city or town, um, oftentimes the central feature in the town will be a statue of Gandhi, uh, oftentimes along a road that's named after Gandhi. Now, moving along, I'm, I'm going to get to um, uh, the era of, uh, you know, after British uh, rule, the, the era of independence. India gets its independence in 1947. Um, but in India, the, the other significant year um, politically was the year 1950. That was the year that India became a uh, democratic republic. It adopted a constitution um, and it became a, you know, a parliamentary uh, democratic state uh, and severed the last bonds that it had with uh, British colonialism. Uh, and the Indian constitution is in many ways quite similar to the American constitution. In fact, the, 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 uh, the authors of the Indian constitution looked uh, specifically towards the American constitution uh, when they were drafting it. Uh, the constitution was also a work of art. Uh, there was actually an artist who was commissioned, again, Nandalal Bose, this figure who you know, painted the previous painting I showed you of Gandhi or those early Pan-Asian paintings. Uh, and he actually assembled a group of, of painters uh, to put together kind of artistic renderings uh, that would go along with the Indian constitution. So the Indian constitution is unique in many ways. It's, first of all, one of the longest constitutions in the world. And unlike the American constitution, you cannot fit it in your pocket. It's, it's, it's like a book, it's as weighty as a book, uh, but it also has an expression of, of art. Um, the Indian constitution is in many ways an unfulfilled promise. Uh, it promised an equal society where the state would use things like science or rationalism uh, to promote equality, uh, to promote, uh, you know, getting rid of uh, rid of ideas like caste or religious divisions or ethnic div divisions. And uh, these are unfulfilled goals in, in modern Indian society, but it, it still is a, a very important political uh, symbol in modern India. I mean, just a few months ago, when anti-government protests were uh, flaring in India before the start of the pandemic, people carried around this particular image, a picture of the, the Indian constitution to talk about their beliefs of how the actions of the present government in India were actually against um, the constitution. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, the Indian constitution featured uh, artistic works. Uh, the constitution was divided into 22 sections, uh, and each of these 22 sections had a work of art that portrayed an image from uh, Indian history. So th the first section portrayed um, an image from uh, the Indus Valley civilization uh, during the very beginnings of, of you know, of, of, uh, of history in India, 4,000 years ago. And the last section uh, portrayed an image uh, from uh, the Indian independence movement from the 20th century. So you have 4,000 years of Indian history being portrayed in art uh, in, the, in the Indian constitution. Now, 
India started off under its firm, first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, with a very particular uh, vision in mind of what India should be. Uh, Gandhi, uh, sorry, Nehru wanted India to be uh, a rationalist, uh, science-based state where science and technology would be used uh, to help India overcome its poverty. Uh, and to that degree, he was he was positing something kind, kind of like a, a radical rupture from Indian uh, traditions, whether they be cultural, religious, uh, or, or artistic. I mean, he very famously said that uh, dams and power plants will be our new temples. You know, in modern India, these will be uh, the centers of devotion rather than, say, temples or mosques or what have you. Uh, so he, he goes so far as to actually commission the building of a new city uh, in the state of Chandigarh, uh, in the state of uh, Punjab, a city called Chandigarh. And in order to build the city, he employs uh, the French modernist architect Le Corbusier. Uh, and Corbusier brings, again, his kind of concrete brutalism uh, to the plains of India. Uh, but at the same time, you see elements of in Indian syncretism at work. Uh, so this is the High Court at Chandigarh, which is perhaps uh, Corbusier's most famous artistic work, ar architectural work in Chandigarh. But there are elements of kind of Mughal or North Indian styles here. Uh, so the, 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 the style of windows is kind of um, reminiscent of uh, a kind of window work called jalis uh, that were used by the Mughals to kind of uh, protect the sun uh, and sunlight from those inside the building. Uh, and you see this long overhanging hanging roof, which you know is, is, is typical of Corbusier's work, uh, but is also similar to uh, a style of uh, Indian architecture called the chajja, which is this long overhanging hanging, uh, roof uh, uh, cornice uh, to protect against uh, you from uh, the sun. Now, even though uh, the Indian state was uh, portraying kind of like this radical modernist break from Indian tradition, uh, Indian artists, of course, were going to do their own thing. Uh, they were going to go with their own ideas and traditions, um, independent of political uh, direction. Uh, and you, you start to see in, in uh, independent India, again, a flowering of different traditions that borrowed uh, from all across the world. Uh, so M.F. Hussein, who was one of India's greatest artists in the, the late 20th century, was known for bringing kind of like a Picasso-style abstractionism uh, to Indian art. Um, and he incorporated it in all sorts of themes. So uh, paintings of Mother Teresa, what you see over here, he was inspired to paint Mother Teresa after visiting some of her homes in Calcutta. Um, Hussein also uh, you know, painted images of Christ uh, and most controversially, uh, images of Indian uh, Hindu gods and goddesses. Uh, and these actually landed him in trouble. Um, you know, just about maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, it actually forced him into exile because we had a lot of um, right-wing um, Hindu nationalists protesting that uh, this somehow was defiling uh, you know, Hindu gods and, and the portrayal of, of Hindu gods. So Emma Hussein actually died in exile. Uh, but again, you, you see again, you know, kind of this blending of Western and, uh, um, and Indian traditions uh, in new syncretic forms. Now, just as artists from around the world came to India to explore uh, Indian art and bring maybe bits of art, of Indian art back to their home countries, uh, Indian artists uh, did the precise opposite. They started going to Europe in greater numbers, uh, bringing European styles to India, or oftentimes even uh, living uh, in Europe. Uh, so Syed Haider Raza was part of a group of artists in Bombay in the 1930s and 1940s called the Progressive Artist Groups. Uh, and these were a group of left-wing socialist artists and writers uh, who again painted in modernist styles, um, you know, whether that be abstractionism, uh, cubism, uh, or in this case, kind of like watercolor impressionism. Um, and, uh, you know, th they brought their artistic traditions to other parts of the world. Uh, Raza uh, would go on to, uh, you know, study uh, in Paris at the uh, Ecole Nationale des Beaux Arts, uh, and he eventually uh, lived much of his life in France, uh, where, you know, again, he blended his own particular traditions. Um, but you still do have artists again coming from around the world to India to experience Indian life and, and bring you know a slice of Indian culture into their work. Now, perhaps the most famous example of this happening uh, is with regard to music. I mean, we all know about how the Beatles came to uh, India in the 1960s. They came to places like Rishikesh in order to learn about Indian spiritualism and join ashrams and such. Um, 
there are countless other examples. And, and to give you a very offbeat kind of lesser known example, um, you know, some Soviet artists came to India uh, and uh, incorporated, you know, you know, painted Indian artistic scenes and, and incorporated Indian art into their own styles. Uh, so one artist was a man called Semyon Chuikov, uh, who is actually from uh, the region that we now call Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he's actually called the father of Kyrgyz paintings. Some of some of his uh, paintings, which are exhibited in Moscow and in Bishkek and in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, are considered to you know kind of had spawned this artistic tradition in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he comes to India in the 1950s and he um, is dazzled with India. He he portrays uh, paintings uh, of of you know and scenes of life from India uh, that uh, capture a specific part of Indian life. I mean, he this is what he writes. Uh, in, to describe his own paintings. He, he says, here is India, neither exotic nor ethnographic, but the people's India. I wanted my paintings to depict this beautiful, poetic and noble soul of the Indian people. Uh, so here again, you see a different type of syncretism. I mean, obviously a very socialist inflected proletarian style of art, talking about the people rather than kind of exotic princes or you know, people being portrayed in an exotic life, but kind of the normal people instead. Um, and this is being incorporated, this kind of Soviet world frame uh, with Indian subjects. And, you know, still today, if you go to say the new Tretikov gallery in, in Moscow, you can see many of these paintings, which were quite popular uh, and influential uh, in the Soviet times and, and still continue to be uh, popular in, in Russia today. I mean, there's a great deal of artistic exchange uh, between Russia and India to this today, uh, to, uh, even today. and. Even Bollywood movies uh, remain very, very popular uh, in Russia uh, nowadays. So the, the last thing, you know, what I, what I want to end my presentation with is, is, is looking at the contemporary moment. Uh, so when we look at India today, you know, it's, it's been argued oftentimes that everything in India is political. Um, India is an intensely political society. I mean, if you turn on the TV um, uh, today, you, you'll see everything being discussed from the lens of politics. Uh, and it, it can sometimes make, um, you know, Indian television, uh, you know, American television news look quite tame uh, in comparison. Um, now, um, art quite naturally has been, you know, the subject of politics to the same degree as all other elements of life in India. Uh, I spoke to you about how M.F. Hussein, uh, his particular artwork became political uh, in the past, you know, 10, 20 years and how he was kind of forced into exile. Uh, well, other Indian artists have also uh, dabbled with political ideas. Uh, so one of the painters in your in your series is a man called Kanishka Raja, who's from Bengal, uh, and he painted um, a series in, in uh, the early 2000s. This particular series is, is not in your collection, but it's, it's related, uh, called Where Were You in, in 92? Uh, and 1992 refers to an incident in the year 1992 uh, when um, Hindu right-wing nationalists uh, pulled down a Mughal style mosque uh, that was uh, built in the city of Ay Ayodhya, which supposedly had been built on the site of a, of a temple to Lord Ram, uh, the, the Hindu god. Um, and, you know, this has become a defining political uh, feature, uh, you know, issue uh, in modern Indian history. Uh, it has become like kind of like a lightning rod issue. I mean, kind of like, say, what the debate about abortion is in America. This whole Ram Temple, Ayodhya Mosque uh, issue has become kind of a lightning rod controversial issue to the same degree uh, in India. And so this artistic work. Uh, where Raja is is talking about you know events from 1992 are meant to ev evoke the the style of uh, windows that were on the demolished Babri Masjid, uh, this this Mughal mosque uh, that you know was demolished by zealots uh, and is now actually being replaced by uh, a Hindu temple uh, you know which is being constructed as we speak. So I'll, I'll, I'll just end on this idea. So, you know, in, in, in India, just as in America, you know, we're, we're going through a unique political moment. I mean, this is a moment that's kind of been very turbulent. It's, it's tested a lot of uh, people's ideas of, of, you know, how robust democracy is and whether you know, countries will remain a democracy. Uh, but we can expect artists, uh, like many of the artists who are being portrayed in your exhibit, uh, to take many of these ideas and express them in art. And you, I think what you'll start to see in the next few years is how a different type of syncretism has developed where, you know, these doubts about democracy and doubts about democratic viability uh, are being incorporated, once again incorporating traditions with Indian art and the West uh, into new styles and forms. Thank you.